section twenty eight of introducing irony by maxwell bodenheim this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard section twenty eight ethics ethel kern was an acrobat with kern's twelve ring circus but her bones were riveted together by a precariously brittle dignity as she paraded down the field of daisies to a cliff at the edge of the sea perhaps acrobats walk stiffly during their leisure hours because their bodies become ascetic when released from an unreal sensual agility ethel kern sometimes stooped to pick a daisy and her body received motion in a deliberately ungallant manner as though greeting an unwelcome mistress her face was an indiscreetly torn screen for emotions that had been dead for many years her low forehead broke into the tinily pointed lustres of her features her body was as slim as a symbolized cricket's lament she crossed the field of daisies intensely dissolved into a forethought of afternoon and stood underneath a tree at the edge of the cliff as she leaned against the tree it seemed as if a giant had courteously lent his umbrella to a rudely unresponsive dwarf below her the sea grunted with automatic fury and receded like a pleased actor winds threw their weird applause against the blue and gray rocks the calmer air underneath the tree was not unlike a distressed mind caught between the noises ethel kern seated herself beneath the tree and read a paper-bound novel entitled the fate of eleanor martin but the sea and the rocks interfered too effectively with eleanor and her pretended life slid into the reality at the foot of the tree while ethel peered aggressively down at the waves a whim winked its narcotic eye at her mind the waves became fellow workers and she was an audience critically examining their turns a little higher with that green somersault come on old chicken you can do a longer slide if you try her mind cried amiably lost in the syncopation of admiration her body swayed with the waves and her brown hair went adventuring then like a jilted servant her mood ran from her brandishing its abashed haste over her body. Sorrow struck her face with a crazily gay second that extinguished her eyes. Her body improvised its lines into a wilted sexlessness that made her black skirt and pink waist mysterious. The torture of a lost love had feasted upon her flesh and reduced it to an abstraction. Hearn, the circus master, presided over the feast like a chilly urbane magician without a trace of sensual longing she recalled his little black moustache standing like a curt intrigue over his lips and the way in which it had bitten into her mouth became the unreal memento of something she had never possessed like all women gazing back at a departed love she felt a swindled poverty that could not quite decide whether it had once owned wealth or not this feeling translated itself in exclamatory vowels that could not find the consonance of her past passion she smiled like a bedraggled masquerading tragedy it takes women years to perfect this masquerade but they win a distracted pleasure that guards them from haggling memories to generalize about women is to broaden our hope that one woman may serve for the rest philosophers disappointed in love often do this though the man on the street is a fairly adept mimic ethel kern's bosom lightly scolded her pink waist and her poignantly devilish smile almost persuaded her that it was real all the tragedy on her face spent itself in a distressed question in unison with this proceeding a perturbed monologue within her addressed her vanity which was silkily perched upon an emotional balcony hearn treated me white blue garters with a real diamond in the centre he never smiled when he kissed god why couldn't i keep him he stayed with me a year and there's not a woman in the troop who's had him more than a month he's a lion rat 
but he never smiled when he kissed me i wonder whether he'd smile if i slit his throat what did i ever see in that fat face he'll be a joke in a few years they all throw you down unless you get in ahead of them if i broke a bottle against his mug i'd only make him happy it had blue silk tassels and he paid three hundred for it i drank too much blue silk tassels he's better than most of them i knew what he wanted and i'm bawling him out because he got it he treated me white blue silk garters with real diamonds that would make the queen of england wink the devilishly poignant smile and the monologue met each other within her while fleeing back to their graves and their unpremeditated clash illuminated the renunciation upon her face she looked into her upturned yellow turban as though it held elusive dregs brooding experimented with her head and suddenly threw it to the ground dissatisfied she lay there like the impoverished effigy of a far-off love her black skirt revealed her slim legs with gloomy discourtesy and her fluffy pink waist gave its babyish sympathy to the sharpness of her back her slender but muscular arms stretching over the grass were senseless branches touching the shoulders of the armless effigy the wind trifled with her loose brown hair and incited it to ironically flitting imitations of life dead thoughts and emotions united upon her hidden face and gripped it with decayed finesse she rested perilously unconcerned upon the sloping edge of the cliff suddenly in a sibilant prank the earth fled beneath her body and she disappeared they knelt around her prostrate figure hugged by the pale blue indelicacy of tights and the scant impudence of her yellow bodice high above her a little wooden board dangled helplessly from a long wire while another wire hung loosely above it she opened her eyes and stared with a lustreless disbelief at the people who were like a tension ready to snap damn him he did me dirty she cried to the amazed painted faces above her End of section twenty eight section twenty nine of introducing irony by maxwell bodenheim this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard section twenty nine history sunlight stuck to the gray floor like curdled honey and clung to the black wall like visible fever on the breast of a savage this contradiction gave a fugitive radiance to the room in which king ferdinand stood moulding figures of happiness on sunless days the room was a depressed insult to his rejoicing forcing it into adroit retorts he had made this chamber a necessary enemy as he moulded his figures of happiness his wife stood beside him ready with colours you have almost finished this half pyramid of eyes emerging from a flat surface and ending against a vertical wall she said as though the sound of her words made their obviousness subtle what colour shall i use to excite your design king ferdinand turned to her like a blind man peering into fantastically returning sight creative absorption had ruffled his middle-aged face into an ageless insurrection but when he spoke a wrinkled order once more reigned beneath the granite lull of his forehead give each eye a different shade of colour and for the wall make a blue of inhuman brightness a blue that has swallowed a constellation and defies night he said this form symbolizes my last happiness wherein the clashing sequences of my life have been smashed into a challenging glare i have become immortal until i voluntarily tender my immortality to death if he takes it the wrinkles on king ferdinand's cheeks ascended to a sentence of belief hacked upon his forehead his broadly cumbersome face shrunk to a lighter scope and his red moustache shone like a coal of expectation his wife played with her dark green gown as though it were relaxed gaiety 
her body like a plump blunder ended in the daft recklessness of her head the high amber of her face raised its slightly turned lines of brooding abandon she looked at her husband as though she considered his flesh an unimportant tragedy calmed by his words the smell of listening earth drifted through a window and bird cries violated the air like expiring emotions king ferdinand stood in the manner of one to whom motion has become a dim travesty and the blood in his veins was a prisoned resonance his folded arms were weighted in a marble posture beneath his long sleeves queen muriel touched his arm and gave him life she led him to a corner of the room and unveiled a small figure and her hands were pliant consummations my first happiness she said in a voice of climbing distinctness they carried the figure to the light almost as slim as a personified plant stem a conventionalized monk grew straight from the centre of two lean hands cupped into the semblance of a flower pot the hands met each other in an effortless tenderness the thinly high monk bore the suggestions of hood and cassock and his face wore a look of indistinct triumph and so i like to believe that your happiness has grown uncertainly from the rarely caught touch of my hands she said the door of the room opened and two men strode in one of them curved upward into pompous impatience the tight inquisitiveness of a gaudy uniform revealed his tall body his face was like an expansive fallacy large rolls of flesh indecisively interrogated the thin slant of his nose and slid into the refuge of his brown beard the second man was waspishly abbreviated and clad in mincing castrations of colour his tinily sharp face suggested a soulless beetle have you come as usual to bestow your explosive admiration on my figures said king ferdinand to the man whose face resembled a redundant mistake three men of your guard will murder you with restrained admiration to-morrow noon answered the other man in whose voice a sneer and apprehension were partners in a minuet you will be killed on the palace steps and the cheers of a huge audience will make death's leer articulate to you while you have taken the role of a hermit in an aesthetic petticoat your friends have been arranging a last happiness for you you are considered an imbecile who paints pretty figures with the blood of his country the flashing hardnesses of a wintry repose assaulted king ferdinand's face my brothers are quite willing to use this blood as an unsolicited rouge for the lips of their mistresses he answered in a tone of remotely amused reproach i have not assailed my subjects with taxes or led them to wars and that has been a serious error they are probably in the position of a man with his chains removed who is angry because he has forgotten how to dance the accurately shortened man spoke when you are dead sire your brothers will gamble for your throne by throwing roses at your head he who first succeeds in striking your bulging eyes will win death does not like to be made a cheated jester said king ferdinand he will doubtless devise a better joke for my winning brother queen muriel whose face had grown old with choked disdain stepped forward now that your shrewd bantering has made itself sufficiently nude tell us why you have come she said the tall man who carried with him the air of an animated mausoleum spoke to-day i saw an old libertine tottering down the boulevard glancing to his feet he spied a lily clipped and fresh he sidled blithely to the edge of the walk to avoid stepping on the flower there is little pleasure after all in flattening a child from another world my carriage will take you to the frontier to-night my caprices have never been able to strut gorgeously because they hold a sincere sympathy for motion said king ferdinand still mechanically jesting his hand rose to one cheek as though signalling for a friendly trance and his eyes closed unceremoniously we will take your carriage 
he said in the voice of an abstracted tight-rope walker the two men tilted their gaudiness into imperceptible bows and departed king ferdinand and his wife stood staring at each other as though their bodies were teasing curtains then without remembering what had occurred they let gay words poke each other and began to discuss colors for the monk's figure rising from cupped hands and blossoming into indistinct triumph that night their carriage stopped upon a hilltop and they were killed by three men one of the three had a thin nose and a brown beard the tight inquisitiveness of a bright uniform revealed his tall body among historians among historians he was to be noted as the man who killed an imbecile king and led his country to glory and prosperity End of section twenty nine section thirty of introducing irony by maxwell boldenheim this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt ferrari section thirty psychic phenomena carl dell and anita starr were speaking of a dead woman who had influenced their eyes she had also refined their heads to a chill protest their faces involved and disconsolate had not solved her absence and their voices were freighted with a primitive martyrdom carl was fencing with the end of his youth his body held that impenetrable cringing which pretends to ignore the coming of middle age and is only betrayed by rare gestures he was tall with a slenderness that barely escaped being feminine the upper part of his face was scholarly and the lower part roguish and the two gave him the effect of a sprite who has become erudite but still retains the memory of his former identity his protruding eyes were embarrassed as though someone behind them had unexpectedly pushed them from a refuge with eminence finesse they apologize for intruding upon the world it is almost tautology to say that they were gray his small brown moustache had a candidly misplaced air as it touched the thin bacchanal of his lips it was a mourner at the feast anita starr's form would have seemed stout but for the sweeping discipline of its lines but this careful suppression ended in a riot when it came to her face her face was a small lyrical revel that had terminated in a fight her nose and chin were strident but her cheeks and mouth were subtly unassuming her blue eyes brilliantly and impartially sighted both sides of the conflict glistening spirals of reddish-brown hair courted her head sitting in the parlor of the star home anita and carl spoke of a dead woman who had influenced their eyes it was two a m and the atmosphere resembled a disillusioned reminiscence still and heavy they had talked about this dead woman throughout the evening welcoming any sound that might surprise her profile into life when alive she had been the chanting whirlpool of their existences and when she died sound ceased for them their voices became mere copies of its present reign because i loved her any common pebble became a chance word concerning her and flowers were enthusiastic anecdotes of her presence said carl for an hour he had been breaking his love into insatiable variations one who seduces the fleeting expressions of a past torture she may have been an august vagabond from another planet a planet where loitering is a solemn profession said anita even when she performed a menial task she awed it with her thoughtful reluctance like a fitful gleaner she crept through bare fields of people accepting their bits of laughter and refusal when she met us she stepped backward as from a tempting unreality and knocked against death carl sat like a groveling fantasy weary of attempting to capture a genuine animation but anita had forced herself into a tormented erectness the clock struck three without a word or a glance in each other's direction they left their chairs turned out the lights 
and ascended the stairway carl slightly in advance they halted at the first landing and faced each other with the uncomplaining helplessness of people suddenly scalded by reality in the morning we will eat oranges from a silver dish and glibly cheat our emotions said carl this deftly impolite proceeding never stops to ask our consent said anita in a voice whose lethargy barely observed a satirical twinkle another word would have been a ridiculous impropriety they parted and entered their rooms flower scents filtered through carl's open window like softly dismayed sins and the cool repentance of a summer night glided into his room upon a pathway of moonlight for a while he sat absent-mindedly burnishing the knives that had divided his evening after he had undressed he fell upon his bed like one hurriedly obliterating an ordeal his consciousness played with a black hood then a crash mastered the room and the door swung open his blanched face paid a spasmodic tribute to the sound and his gray eyes greeted the darkness as though it were an advancing mob with a strained stoicism he waited for a repetition of the sound the moments were sledgehammers fanning his face with their close passage then his bed weirdly meddled with his body and became a light cradle rocked by some arrogant hand the darkness tingled lifelessly like an electrocuted man carl's waiting began to feel sharply disgraced and his senses planned a revolt he tried to rise to a sitting posture but his body insulted his desire at this point the darkness softened to the disguised struggle of a woman striving to reach him the significance of this cast an impalpable but potent consolation upon the straining of his chained body the rocking of his bed measured a powerfully cryptic welcome and he tried to decipher it with the beat of his heart each of its syllables became the cadence impact of another person against a toughly pliant wall his body demolished its tenseness and pressed a refrain into the swaying bed he decorated the darkness with the crisp flight of his voice perish upon the turmoil of each day and make it inaudible but let the night be our hermitage he cried to a dead woman as though replying the rocking of his bed gradually lessened and the darkness became an opaque farewell he turned to the shaft of moonlight which was tactfully intercepting the floor of his room it had the unobtrusive intensity of a melted chinaman for hours he gave it his eyes and dimly contradicted it with his heart when the dawn made his room aware of its limitations he closed his eyes at the breakfast table he and anita greeted each other with a warm brevity their eyes found an empty solace in the white tablecloth and their minds felt a bright impotence like beggars idling in the sun for a while the tinkle of their spoons amiably pardoned their constraint but anita finally spoke with the staccato of one who snaps unbearable thongs she came to me last night i heard a sound like a huge menace stumbling over a chair the door opened and the darkness grew as heavy as dead flesh my bed swayed with the precision of a grieving head carl's face broke and gleamed like a soft ground blocked by sudden rain the same things happened to me he said in the voice of a child wrestling with a minor chord they sat heavily disputing each other with their eyes did you lie afterwards censuring the moonlight asked anita carl nodded anita's mother majestically blundered into the room exuberantly substantial with the face of a child skilfully rebuked by an elderly masquerade she flattered a chair at the table wasn't that a terrible storm we had last night she babbled the rain kept me awake for hours i'm such a late sleeper you know i do hope you children manage to rest End of section thirty section thirty one of introducing irony by maxwell bodenheim this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Berard. section thirty one love 
the knight received the moonlight in the manner of a sophisticated braggart who slaps the face of an old impassive man mrs robert calvin taylor observed this illusion and painted it upon one of the lanterns lighting a little party within her heart the guests at the party fat sophists and slatterns in gay patched clothes gathered around the lantern and felt relieved at the impersonal novelty of its decoration if mrs robert calvin taylor had been a philosopher or a scientist she would have changed the night to an unseen background or a chemical diagram she would have ignored the pleading of her heart for pictorial distraction but since she was a society woman tired of sensual toys and a mental twilight she welcomed the night as her first effectual lover sitting in the garden of her country home she could see the lighted windows of her crowded ballroom and hear the saccharine pandemonium of a jazz orchestra the noise reminded her of a middle-aged roue snickering as he rolled his huge dice while gambling for a new mistress she felt glad that her new lover the knight did not seek to court her with such a blustering clatter the knight was incredibly sophisticated but held the pungently awkward body of a youth crashing against trees and bushes this mixture pierced mrs robert calvin taylor and slid far beneath those sensual routines which are the delight of psychoanalysts slid to a depth where aesthetic passion slays the flesh and blends it into a sexless potency she felt a sense of bodiless conflagration striding with wide steps beside the night when the limitless glow died within her she glanced down and found that she was naked the complicated shrewdness of her clothes had disappeared by this time she had ceased to be mrs robert calvin taylor she had become an expectant novice in a new world and even the jazz music and ballroom laughter had changed to the mumbled rumors of a past existence therefore her nakedness failed to disconcert her she touched her shoulder with a gesture of matter-of-fact congratulation and loosened her hair to rid herself of a last dab of incongruity then she rose from the stone bench and walked down a pathway leading to the great lake that bounded one side of her country estate she felt the powerful and sober curiosity of one who has decided to become a recluse and examines the deserted possibilities of his roofless plateau she reached a high bluff rising over the placid vanity of the huge lake combing its bluish-black hair with moonlight suddenly she became aware of a figure standing beside her she turned with a gasp of strangled aloofness the ethereal composure of her small face defended by moonlight sheared into an ebony cast of hermit-like annoyance but when the colour and outlines of the figure shrunk within her eyes her face changed again an astounded immersion crowned her head tugging at her short nose straightening her thick lips and cleaving her grey eyes the slightly deteriorated slenderness of her short body lowered a bit toward the earth not from fear but because of a weakening incredulity the figure before her was that of a sexless human being small and slim of statute nude and hued with an inhumanely concentrated black the head held large eyes that shone like metaphysical diamonds as though ten thousand stars were carousing together in a realm of compressed light the figure spoke to mrs robert calvin taylor and its voice seemed thrown forth by the rays from its eyes the voice was distinct and subdued you are not a hermit who has turned a garden into a solitary castle said the figure what am i asked mrs robert calvin taylor your mind and heart are no longer clad in their heavy mirages of love fear and sleep said the figure the surface pictures have gone and the twin bazaars of your heart and mind are exchanging a long deferred greeting within the now mingled bazaars emotions and thoughts have become friends and sell each other endless variations in color light and form i am the being who rules this proceeding have you a name asked mrs robert calvin taylor using the unashamed naivete of a child 
men call me aesthetics answered the figure in my weakest form i make the eyes of the shop girl hesitate a bit as she views an unusually gaudy sunset in my strongest manifestations i help poets and artists to contradict their personal lives but these are merely my outward indications i line the hearts and minds of all human beings often remaining within them unfelt until they die in rare cases such as yours the mirages hiding and dividing me are slain and i clap my hands sending motion to the twin bazaars of heart and mind what caused me to uncover you within myself said mrs robert calvin taylor you yielded to a whim and made the knight your lover dissatisfied with the loves and fears he found within you the knight threw them aside one by one thus slaying the mirages that hid me your other lovers of the past were content with more material gifts and did not seek to uncover you i am bare now what will you do with me said mrs robert calvin taylor the figure laid a hand upon her shoulder his eyes burnt her to a petal of ashes that fell down between them mr robert calvin taylor stood over the form of his young wife who sat slouched down upon a stone bench within their garden he shook her shoulder lightly she uttered a perturbed mumble and did not raise the head resting upon one of her arms the moonlight fell upon the silken complexities of her dress poor dot i warned her not to take a third glass he muttered to himself as he raised her in his arms and staggered down the garden pathway end of section thirty one end of introducing irony by maxwell bodenheim